there's great things happening on both sides. How do we maximize that and amplify it? That's by working together. And that's where we're not there yet. It's, it's, that's the truth about women's hockey. All right. Here with Anya Packer. Whoa. First time saying that one. How yeah. You doing? <laughs> I thought you were going to say that. I'll give it. It's Packer. I know. I was ready. I was ready for it. Anya Packer. How you doing? Good. How are you? Thanks for having me. You know, I love to chat. So. Oh, I know you do, which is why I love having you on as a guest. We're going to bring back the Founding Four Pod. Very excited. Going to be an independent podcast. Uh, so we're definitely going to be working with you and a lot of the players. But all that to say, going into season five of the NWHL. Now, you know, I know that a lot has happened over the summer. Uh, but first we'll start. Yeah. Just a few <laughs> things here and there, you know, uh, Maya Moore took the year off in the WNBA. Of course, that's what I was alluding to, but, um, Same. but, <laughs> but, but one big thing that happened, hence the name change is that you got married. Congratulations. Thank you. Yes. That is not the biggest thing that happened this summer, but in my <laughs> small universe, it is the most monumentally crazy, exciting best day of my life and that's it that's amazing pictures looked stunning saw some video of the dancing amazing so happy for you both a little bit sad though we lose someone at the top of the alphabet oh so sad i'm a p I now know. i used I know. to be a b i was so much more superior i'm saying you know but that's all right <laughs> Not everyone can 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 roll with the AYs, the BAs. It's okay. No, no, it happens. I know. It happens. <laughs> but oh. in addition to all of that, you have uh, still been holding down the fort as the director of the NWHL Players Association. And last we spoke, uh, we were talking about what was known at the time as kind of the for the game movement, which has now transitioned into the PWHPA. So. Again, going into season five, Anya, where are you at with the PA? Uh, we we know that uh, some things like revenue share, some things like contracts have have um, been discussed, but but what can fans, what can players expect going into season five? I think that now the the PA has gotten to a place where we feel really good about the verbiage and the contract. We feel really good about what we were able to achieve from our call to action that we were given from, you know, last season, we kind of asked everybody, what's the goal? What do we want? What do we want to change? What is our, you know, five-year goal? What's our immediate goal? Um, so we had a lot of those metrics on the contract negotiation. So I am really ecstatic with that. So what it gave my team the capability to do is kind of look at other things. So for me, a big thing is how do we connect with, and, and this is something that I've kind of got in the back of my head, two major things, recovery, from games, from activities, recovering for our players, and then the other side of the fence, like finances. So these two big projects for me are something that I'm really passionate about. How do we get our athletes access to the best tools of recovery now that we're playing two game weekends? And off the ice, how do we get them the financial support to better understand how to set themselves up as a launch pad from this moment, from being a professional athlete? So those are my two big goals in the off season. That's definitely what I'm working on. Um, excuse me, in the on season now that we're going to, to play yeah. games. So that's definitely something there. that I've got in my head. I love it. All right. So let's go with the latter first, because I think that's a little bit easier, especially yep. given the news that we've gotten in the last few weeks, uh, which include uh, we've got a, a, another sponsor. There's Chipwitch that's on board. Uh, and then, of course, the broadcast deal with Twitch. Um, and so last time we spoke again on you, you were talking about the revenue share. You said that that was locked into contracts, but we didn't really have a good sense of what that would look like necessarily. But with these two sponsors, in particular, can you walk people through what that means for the league and because of the revenue share now, what that will mean for players? Yeah. Any deal that comes in is, let me talk about the players first and then I'll talk about the league. Any deal that sure. comes in is divided in half. So tomorrow, say founding for podcast says we're going to sponsor the league for a hundred thousand dollars, just to use round numbers. The league will get 50,000 and then the players cut will get 50,000. We have five teams, so each team will divide that out equally. Each team will get $10,000. Now, say a player owns 10% of the salary cap for the Riveters, they'll get 10% of that $10,000. So that's just basic 
like cut and dry how it's going to go. When a deal comes in, the players will get respective to what they've negotiated for themselves. So this is where their own negotiating power really helps them. Um, respective to what they've negotiated for themselves, they'll get a percentage of the player take. Um, so that's huge. First and foremost, salaries are growing every time a sponsor walks in the door. Now, when it comes to like Twitch, for example, that's us getting paid for our content. That's somebody looking at our players and saying, you're worth to me a dollar amount that I'm willing to put towards broadcasting women's hockey. Um, mm-hmm. So that was huge in and of itself as well, because it's a not only a justification moment, but also other sponsors are now saying, okay, whoa, Twitch is new. That's exciting. You already have a great market. Now you're going to reach this whole nother demographic that we've been going after. So it really opens the potential for um, the players. And, and I feel like that kind of touched on the league as well. It's really opened some doors for us that we haven't had in the past and given us a new look at how to market, being really creative, looking at live events and really having hands-on approaches um, to how brands are going to engage with women's sports and women's hockey and making sure that that's coming to life at our games through the Twitch feeds and through our social. So there's a lot of stuff that's going on here. I like that. And, uh, you know, if we want to make that hypothetical for Founding Four podcast a reality, everyone needs to hit us up on Patreon. Thanks for the <laughs> patrons that donate to us. But, I mean, you know, if we want to get in on the ground floor, make sure you do that. We'll, we'll make sure to have all those links. Keep the p- keep the podcast alive. But uh, jokes aside, okay, so we've got these these deals. And, and as you said, the one thing that, in the, uh, of course, as someone who has been a broadcaster and hopes to continue on with the league, of course, course the twitch deal really stood out to me for a few reasons that you kind of alluded to the first being that this is unlike it seems like some of the other broadcast situations this is as you said that twitch is is purchasing the content they're seeing value in in the content and and in the product that is available then the other thing is that um you know twitch is a streaming service it's it's mostly known for gaming but it is a, a really interesting platform that i believe um is owned by amazon and so can yep. you talk a little bit about what that twitch deal will and and how the the interaction among fans will be different as opposed to when we we were seeing games streamed on Twitter and particularly on YouTube. Correct. And there's, there's a lot of functionality, right? So first and foremost, being, um, you know, a product that they're going to purchase, you'd think, okay, well, it's going to be X amount of dollars to watch it. It's going to be free. They're letting us put our content out there to any person that wants to watch our games for free, which is monumental. You know, when we're getting paid for it and they're not directly tying that to subscriptions and revenue, it's right. really showing the, the justification as to why they, they worked with us is because they believe in us. So first, that is always something huge for anybody that wants to watch. You don't even actually have to have a Twitch profile. You just have to follow the link. I, I would encourage you to get one because great. But if not, you don't have to. So that helps as well as it being able to go through smart TVs and stream and, and different things. It's kind of a different experience as opposed to watching a Twitter game on your phone. Um, right. and, and no knock on that. It's just a different platform and it's a different, it's a different functionality. It also hits a different demographic. There's a lot of younger people using Twitch and there's a lot of people in the gamer community that are now going to be embracing us as well as the function to use emotes and bits and um, have a different engagement because esports is such a digital community. You really have to build on that and Twitch gives you the function to do so. So outside of going to our core markets, you know, the New England region as well as Um, or Northeast region, as well as Minnesota, it allows us to expand our reach, but also expand our touch. So it's not Mm -hmm. just somebody streaming a game, watching it, clicking a heart. There's a whole different level of um, communication and really feeling like you're embracing that community. So the Twitch deal intrinsically is just different. You know, they have football, they have their signing deals with the NFL, they're working on onboarding different sporting um, events. And so it also brings a whole nother realm of, sponsors that know the Twitch stream or that work with those partners to say, okay, well, we already do this. This is a really easy integration for us and it falls under the digital budget. Let's have this conversation. So there's a lot that comes into play with that deal. Um, 
Yeah. So that's, that's a little that bit way. more about it. Right. Yeah. And I, I was listening to you and then, and then some of the fellows on the Steve Dangle podcast. I spoke to Danny and it sounds like there's also this piece where, um, you know, and I'm, I'm very much so learning Twitch, but that there is some way that uh, as users or as viewers are watching these games, they can directly monetarily impact and, and, and give to the NWHL. Yeah. And I think Danny said maybe even, you know, links to buy jerseys and jerseys. Like, are you, do you know how any of that will work just yet? Yep. So if I am on Twitch and I buy bits, I can buy $50 worth of bits and say I'm watching a game and pack scores a great goal. I can be like 50 bits to that goal. That's sweet. And, you know, comment and kind of when you're a gamer and you're just a person sitting and that's your, that's your career or that's your, you know, passion project and you're getting paid for it. Those bits are how you pay for that, mm-hmm. you know, continuing to be a part of that community. So when we then go to Twitch, we have that function to activate some of those things. So it becomes a great place for people that always ask us, how do we support women's sports? We can't go to games. We live in Arizona. You know, there's a whole contingency of people that want to support women's sports that aren't necessarily in a, in a market, you know? And so instead of me saying, oh, buy a thousand dollar plane ticket and go round trip and stay for the weekend in Minnesota to see two games. Now it's go on Twitch. If you feel so inclined, buy bits, get involved. If you don't, that's fine too. Or maybe someone scores and we link a jersey right there. Like, hey, you know, Kaylee Fracken just scored and then a pop-up comes up with a link to her jersey. And then you're like, yo, that's dope. And you buy it. Like there's a lot of different functions to play with Twitch to really get in there and drive revenue. Yeah, that, and it seems like it's in real time. It's creating this interaction, which, I mean, is is kind of really where we're at when it comes to basically anything, like likes and shares and, you know, um, unique viewers and all of that stuff. So that's really interesting. Um, I do, though, want to, there were some conversations that happened around Twitch, and they were definitely directed towards the Twitch community, but I think that if we're being honest, there are conversations when it comes to integrating women and women in sports, women's sports into um, perhaps to put it um, generally and maybe nicer than it deserves, you know, hyper masculine communities to then introduce a a women's hockey league into that community there are concerns on on what that would do to what the 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 nwhl community as it exists now um and how that might change do you have a sense of are you aware of these conversations and concerns do you share the concerns how would you approach that to someone who maybe wants to support the nwhl but is definitely not here for all of that (laughs) I can, and I can understand it and respect it because, I mean, even when we talk about women's sports integrating into sports, like if I talk about a women's hockey player trying to integrate into the men's hockey community, it can be really exposing and really challenging because, you know, you get the go make me a sandwich comments and the, oh, she's too far from the kitchen comments. Like that's going to exist in a world that's not yet ready to embrace women. Do I feel like that's the Twitch community right now? No. I feel like anything that I've personally been involved with in this whole process has been really open. It's people Mm -hmm. that, you know, enjoy spending time playing games, whether that's a sports game or Fortnite or something, you know, that they're really passionate about. And they're watching women who are equally passionate play a sport that they maybe haven't been exposed to yet. I mean, women's hockey fans are artistic. They're gamers. They're creative. They're badass. They're, on the front lines of, of, you know, any kind of social issue that I feel like comes up. Women's hockey fans, I don't feel like fit in a bucket. So when I say Mm -hmm. we're bringing those fans into a brand new community, maybe there's a connection there. Like we have fans for women's hockey that make the most beautiful like designs and artwork and, and create these crazy cool things for us. And I don't know, I'm not creative. And I'm like, that's dope. Like what you're doing is sweet. And so if that community doesn't necessarily feel like my personal community, but has embraced me as a whole, I think the gamer community is ready for us to kind of all come in there and we're all going to just let our freak flag fly and we'll be (laughs) one crazy crew. But I just think at this point, we're excited for change and the Twitch community is excited to embrace sports. So I don't think that there's that big barrier. 
Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, and, and I guess to be determined, but again, as people who are women in sports, I think there's some of that that unfortunately we, we've become accustomed to being prepared to receive. Uh, so, you know, we'll, we'll see how it goes. But that does lead me to, so in the WNBA side of things, we're wrapping up on WNBA coverage and then I'm sliding right into hockey. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, 2K uh, released their new game. So it's, uh, you know, the, the, w- or the NBA game. Um, and for the first time, they have fully integrated the WNBA. Well, I shouldn't say fully because unfortunately, the female head coaches are still profiled as men in the game. Got to fix that. Got to fix that. But anyway, all that to say, now introducing the gaming community, could you see um, something where women's hockey players are more integrated into, I think it's NHL Live, that they have as one of the games? Would you like to see that? Yeah, I mean, I hope so. I would love to beat Madison while being Madison. <laughs> that would be meta for me. Um, but I think that any time that, that a community embraces female athletes, right? So you take the the NBA gamer community and they start playing as female athletes. That's a bridge that wasn't built before and it's new and it's cutting edge and it's dope. And more people that are women's basketball fans are going to buy the game. More men are going to play as the WNBA teams. There's going to be a whole different jive there that's now starting. So would it be dope if they did the same for hockey players? A hundred percent. It should be the same across the board on all sports. So there's a lot of things that, that, happen and you're like whoa so forward so progressive but you know it's it should end that way so so when you can make your own female athletes um on these sports on these e-games that's when i'm like all right if i can make the riveters let me be the riveters like you do it like because you have all the stats you can go on hockey db download all the stats all the different pieces of it and integrate that in pretty quickly so that would be sweet and like i said i would love to play it and that's where (laughs) you know i think that's where I think we're headed. So it's just a timing thing. That's awesome. And we're going to put out a call. Like you said, so many women's hockey fans that are so gifted and talented. I mean, we've seen action figures. We've seen trading cards and all kinds of stuff. So putting out a call, anyone who's a gamer out there that can make an avatar where Anya can play as Madison Packer against the actual Mad Pack Madison Packer. Yes. And then you have to, you know, soup up her, her make score. Me better. Right. Right. Make, so that she can beat Make a me and make a Madison. Packer. And I, I would win because Maddie's better than me at hockey. But just do that. And then I can challenge her <laughs> and be like, role reversal. I'm the hero. <laughs> That would be amazing. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I feel like I'm going to get in trouble with, with, I almost said Packer, but I can't say Packer you can't. now. I have We're to both say, I, Packers. you're both Packers. I, I'll go Mad Pack. <laughs> for for Mad Pack, and we'll have to we'll we'll, we'll we're going to workshop it. We'll we'll bring you on. We'll figure out what the nickname is going to be. <laughs> we got to figure it out. Yeah, you didn't even give me a hyphen, Anya. No, what the heck? Just new. I'm the other oh, Packer now. Man, like the uh, the other Packer. <laughs> oh man. All right. Well, let's move on because as we alluded to. The Twitch deal is not the only um, info that came in, uh, but but I do want to talk about the other side, the, the 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 side that I think at best has a lot of fans, has um, the women's hockey community uh, community a little bit confused, and that does come to what is going, what is the fall going to look like when we have season five of the NWHL, but we also have the PWHPA doing their uh, Dream Gap tour. So, what are you anticipating? Anticipating, like kind of what are you expecting women's hockey to be like? I expect it to be very interesting. I also expect it to be a little segmented or a little clearly segmented, like line in the sand segmented. Um, in the fall, you're going to have two totally different approaches to women's hockey. You're going to have a league based approach where you're going to have a home team to cheer for and um, practices and all the things that come along with um you know, what we would think of as a standard league. I'm like air quoting it with my hand. And then we're also going to have a barnstorming model where the PWHPA players go to different barns and play quick, like bite-sized tournaments. So um, it's going to be very interesting to see what the dynamic plays out to and and how um, reception is. I, I really honestly hope that the reception is people supporting both. I mean, a rising tide raises both ships. Um, or all ships in that case, but 
just working to move the sport forward. If both of, you know, both different sides have that as their main goal. Um, let's, let's just support women and have it grow and help it grow and, and, you know, be a, a champion of sport and, and development of women's hockey. You know, and, and I know that you've played in the CWHL. Unfortunately, that league is not around. You were a founding member of the Connecticut Whale in the NWHL, and now even in your retirement as a player have stuck it out with the league. I mean, I can only imagine, not to mention that in the middle of you getting married, I can only imagine that just personally, as a hockey player, that this can be a little bit uh, uncomfortable. It can be a, a little bit difficult to really wrap your mind around where the sport is. But you always come across as someone that knows her history, knows the history of women's sports, and certainly the sport that you played and grew up playing. When you look at all the different iterations of women's uh, post collegiate sports because not all of them have been proper professional leagues um where where do you see the sport now in relation to the original nwhl the founding of the cwhl then when the current nwhl started and to where we are now um what's your sense of of where we're at in history it's a little bit to me feels a little bit like a broken record and you know i'm gonna get chastised for saying that because you know, then people throw the start of the NWHL down, you know, out there and say, well, that was the beginning of the end. You know, it really becomes hard in this situation to say, where are we and where are we in relation to where we've been? We're nowhere near where we've been before because we now have visibility. We have followers, both nations, Canada and the U.S. have won a gold medal. I mean, other nations are vying for it and they're close. So, in the scope of where women's hockey is, it's nowhere near where it's been before. However, in the segmentation, in the separation of investments, in where players are having the function to play the sport and to donate their time or get paid for it, like we've gone backwards in that way. But for the growth and development is what everyone's mission as a whole is and has always been. So it's like partially we're in a time machine, but partially we're like, we're very much so right now. So it's kind of a middle, I have a middle answer. Yeah. I mean, and uh, again, I can only imagine what it's like for you to go through this, but, but we have seen this in other women's sports. We've seen it in soccer um, at the, at the national level. And even right now, actively the U S soccer uh, players, women's players association is suing their federation you have uh of course we saw that at usa hockey level where the nhl had to step in to help usa hockey pay the women's national team you have the WNBA actively has uh opted out of their latest uh cba collective bargaining agreement uh with the WNBA, which is essentially um in close partnership if not a direct uh extension of the nba and so when you think of when you think of what you're experiencing and are very much in right now in the context of the larger women's sports landscape, uh, I'm just curious as, as to what, how you think women's hockey will come out on, on the other end. The women's sports landscape is so interesting right now because for all different reasons, across every different sport, players are actively standing up. And that's mm -hmm. tremendous. There's no downside in what's happening. Now, when it comes to women's hockey, where we put a different lens on it, it's a little bit more challenging to understand the entire problem because we had a league fold and then we had a league remain. Whereas, you know, the NWSL players that are also national team players are coming back saying, please come watch us on the national team or come watch us national team players in the NWSL, we have almost the exact opposite going on in our landscape. It's don't go to the NWHL, follow our new spinoff as we know what the next generation needs without that collaborative communication with one another, with two sides of the business, right? Like that's where I think the biggest discrepancy might be is it's not necessarily a function of 
hey, everyone, support the growing game. It's we're segmenting because we don't believe that what's happening is right. We hope it doesn't fold, but we believe in something completely different. At the end, at the end of the day, both initiatives have the long-term goal of paying women's hockey players a livable salary and pioneering forward to make it a reality for the next generation of women. It's just a different, a totally different way to do it on both sides of the fence. Yeah, that's that's an interesting um, differentiation that you made between women's sports in 2019 and women's hockey in 2019 heading into 2020. Um, but with that said, and I asked Danny Ryland this, I'm, I'm curious to get your thoughts. Um, you know, you you've uh, for a lot of people have essentially uh, drawn your line in the sand and have taken a side. You are running the NWHLPA. You are the director of the National Women's Hockey League Players Association and representing those players. I am curious, though, are there things that you have learned from the reactions that you've gotten on the, if we will, other side of the line are there um things that you've learned from reactions that you've seen and heard from fans or from investors that you think will allow you to do your job to the best of your ability as a represent as a representative excuse me of the nwhl players completely i think that this entire thing has gut checked my passions and refocused my mind to not say hey, I'm with the NWHL no matter what. It's more that when I was negotiating a contract, or not even me, my lawyers, when, when we were negotiating a contract, my mission critical priority was to get players closer to a livable wage. Whether that was through revenue driving, whether that was through getting more visibility into what our deals look like or being part of that deal process, which I am now, Um, it was, this is what my goal is. So at the end of it all, when I looked at my options of foregoing being in a league and having no contract to, to substantiate that in a gap or moving forward with a rock solid contract that pays players and is a nights and weekends part-time commitment and will add five, 10, $15,000 to these players' livelihoods. That, to me, hit my mission-critical priorities, which has moved the sport forward. If in two months something changes and and the players deserve something different, and I think that separates us from the league, I will do what's best for the players. But at this time, and, and from every conversation that I've had, the NWHL is providing those futures and is in charge. Is, moving forward to the next generation and is willing to talk to people to collaborate, whether that's the PWHPA, whether that's a, you know, a major entity that has a lot more clout in the hockey space, whether that's, uh, you know, whatever it may be, there's the open and willingness to collaborate that I just, I think that that's the right way. Right. And, you know, I want to stay there before coming and circling back around um, to recovery, which you talked about, which I think, of course, goes into things like insurance and et cetera. But, um, you know, you you talked just now about, you know, that collaboration, that communication and, you know, Danny Ryland, including with people like myself, she's been talking to reporters. And and now at, at, by the time we're talking, several reports have come out about her thoughts on, um, and her, her basically saying that there is no communication with the PWHPA at this point in time. Um, I want to, rather than necessarily rehashing that, because I think, you know, Danny's statements um, are are pretty much straightforward, but I want to go back a little bit, Anya, to when we were talking about, when we were talking, I should say, after the CWHL folded, and and there's something that you said just now that reminded me of, of what you were talking about, about really wanting to make sure that you were trying to broker the best deal from a player's perspective. Now, what does that look like um, when, if and when, let's say when in the future, sometime hopefully in the future, when you're able to talk and there are open lines of communication again with another section of the post-collegiate women's hockey community, what are some of the things that that you hope will be first 
you know, in in that first conversation what what are you curious about from the pw players what would you like feedback from them on i think where my biggest curiosity lies is what the five-year goal is it's not the one-year goal it's not even the two or three-year goals because unfortunately women's hockey completely dissipates from the national team level every olympic year they go to their respective countries they play against one another or against other national teams or against boys teams and They train for what is the most monumental thing in women's hockey is the gold medal. So it's not about the immediate foreseeable future. It's about the five year, the 10 year plan. Who do you, where do you want the money to come from? What are your goals and metrics on KPIs? What do you want the income to be generated to each individual player? How are they going to negotiate that? Do they have agents? Do we have you know, non-Olympic t- agents willing to step up and start working with players. Do we have players that are going to start, you know, foregoing having a day job and do this full time? And when that happens, what markets are they going to be able to afford to live in? I mean, there's so many questions that I, I could just I could continue to ask questions for in 15 hours, probably. <laughs> so really, in that first conversation, what I want to understand is where are you trending towards and how do you how do we, or how do you think we don't align to that or or the players? I guess I don't even, it's less about the league head office and it's more about what do you, your collective group of players have on the whiteboard? What's your, what is, what's circled a hundred times for you? And, and I'll tell you what's circled a hundred times for me. I want players to retire from women's hockey as successful people. I don't want them to feel squandered and squashed and suffocated by the fact that they haven't had an air quotes real job, which happens to athletes all the time. Hmm. That's my big circle on my whiteboard. How do we fix that gap? Obviously I want to pay the players more. Sure. Obviously I want them to use it as their full-time job. Sure. But how do I help them live their lives as successful? Can we do a pension plan? Can we do a 401k? What can we do for these females that are giving their bodies, their brains, their minds, their time, their time with their families. How do we give them what they deserve? That's what I've got on my whiteboard. I want to know what's on theirs. Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, Certainly not speaking for that group, but I think it's very evident that one of the things um, that is a part of the, the women's hockey landscape, you've already mentioned that is salaries. The other part of that though, um, is the health coverage. And that's what I want to get into because our last conversation, we did talk a little bit about what that coverage is looking like under the new contract and in going into season five, but it still sounds like you really want to focus on and be able to continue the trend of progress when it comes to recovery. So first, if you could just really quickly recap what it's looking like, what players will have access to um, when they sign contracts and play in the NWHL for season five. And then again, what is that piece that you're really trying to grow upon? Right. So right now, players have access to a trainer on staff, as well as um, they have all full workers comp. We also have a national Um, or a, excuse me, a league wide partnership with NYU who has a tremendous clinic for um, concussions. Madison got her hip surgery done there. She was back on the ice in record time. I can only speak on my personal understanding of, of, you know, experience for NYU and it's always been tremendous. So we have a group there as well as individual, individual teams have partnerships. So um, again, I can speak with a lot of confidence on the Connecticut whale is partnered with Greenwich sports medicine a tremendous group of, of doctors that donate like office hours to have these players come in and get crazy treatments done. They do everything from dry needling to cold laser to cupping to massage to, um, you know, calibrating the body to really working with these athletes so that they're recovering. Um, so it's been something that's hugely passionate to me to try to make those partnerships and, and encourage GMs to go out there and network with people that can be part of the recovery element of our of our business, especially now that we're having these athletes increase their gains. We're having them you know, train harder. We're trying to really elevate this sport. Most importantly, we need to make sure they're recovering. Their bodies are gold. They're what make us us. So that's something that to me is hugely important. So now on my new recovery mission 
is how do we enhance the autograph line? How do the players go from a, a game to an autograph line and, ha- and, and recover in that time? Because that's mm. crucial minutes. When you're done playing the sport and you're sweaty and you're cooling down and you're ready to get you know, prepared for next week's game and you're going to sign autographs, which is, which is, again, lifeblood of our business. How do I make sure you're recovering in that time? So my goal is now to reach out to as many partners, as many companies to give them exposure to a live event being that autograph line, but also having the players recover in that time, whether it's the right proteins, the right um, sports drinks, the right equipment, the right um, tech, whatever they could possibly use to recover better. Um, All of those brands are, are on the top of my hit list right now for conversation. Wow. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Of course, being an athlete, it's something that a former athlete, I should say, <laughs> Ooh, those days are gone. But uh, you and you I know, both. The, <laughs> I tell you, recovery from like going to get the mail is so legit these days. But um, <laughs> but uh, that's something that, you know, as an athlete, but then now being on the media side, it's not something, honestly, that I've ever really given much, much thought to. But right. you do see some leagues like the NWS. So we've mentioned them a few times. They have cooling off periods where even media, we don't get to them right away. But it sounds like you're really trying to not even think of it from like a logistics perspective or not only from a logistics perspective, but even as far as partnerships and what right. are some of the, the uses of technology um, and just the, the, the way that we think about health and wellness now to be able to integrate into that aspect that is very much a part of the, the NW, NWHL, almost said SL, NWHL <laughs> culture. That's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, it was something that we were definitely knocked on, um, which as an athlete, I know that that's a problem that we've got. It's, you know, you you have so much stuff going on. You're just trying to get everything done and you don't even think like we really should try to strike up a partnership with XYZ company that provides the best recovery gear in the country. You know, how do you not? And then I kind of like was so pissed at myself on Monday. I like called Madison. I'm like, I'm so disappointed in myself. I could have been working on this for so long and I just dropped the ball and she was like, there's no time, but the future. So you've got to just work on it. Like you can't get mad at yourself. You've got to just get a better situation. So, you know, really I've been supercharged by this idea that we don't have, or we're not treated like professional athletes. I mean, there's a, there's athletes all over the world who aren't treated with the right respect when it comes to recovery. They're not given the right tools. The tools are expensive. The tools are, they break, you know, what they need to be professional athletes and have their body primed. And I mean, it even happened at BU that what men, what the men's team had to recover with was much different than what the women's team had to recover with. And it wasn't Mm. until our staff said they deserve those rights and they deserve those, that time with that massage therapist, give it to them that we were even given an hour with the massage therapist. So these are things that I personally now am saying, you know, if we're not going to talk and if we're not going to collaborate and we're not going to work together, I'm going to take bits and pieces of what I'm hearing in the media and try to fix them and recovery and access to the right, you know, treatment is hugely important. And I can find a way to integrate that with a fan experience and still making sure our players are accessible to the media and to fans. I'm going to do it. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. And I'm, I'm definitely going to want to keep up with you on that one, but there's something else Anya that you said, I guess we're just going with Anya now. I, I got to get another nickname. <laughs> I mean, it just sounds so formal. Ugh, I, we we, we got to work this out. All right. All right. Well, anyway, Anya for now, um, <laughs> you know, the, I've, I've spoken to you now for how many years, like, have you been doing this? Oh, um, this you know, I'm telling you, well, obviously it, 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 no more than five, but, um, <laughs> But, um, you know, and it strikes me that you are, are, are still trying to push the needle. But one thing that I remember very clearly is when we were talking around this time last season, getting ready for season four, one of the things that you were really trying to work hard on was a contract and putting some of the things that you've been able to put in place for this new contract, trying to put that in place before season four. Right. And, you know, as I understand from 
collecting information from different people that I've spoken to across the league. It just seems like at the time, and, and you hear this in sports, certainly in women's sports a lot, just at the time that not all of the players were maybe um, on the same page or needed or wanted the same things from the contract. So some of those negotiations for, for new things to put into the contract fell to the wayside as people started signing the contract as is. But now we flash forward and in this off season between season four and the beginning of season five, we kind of saw exactly what you had hoped to happen happen, but in and outside of the NWHL, that being that players got on the same page and started talking to each other and set an expectation for what they wanted. And, and that's the, inter- that's an interpretation that, that I'm giving of what I understand the PWHPA now to be. I do want to ask you, you know, just putting in all of that work, how where are you at with that just kind of where this this up and down roller coaster of being the the director of of this players association has taken you well i'll explain it in two ways the first being a story of madison and i on our honeymoon not thinking about a thing we're like winding down i think we just went like fishing, like this crazy, whatever. And I turned and I said, I'm not going to sleep tonight because women's hockey is on my mind. I- mm. I'm not going to sleep. I stayed up all night long. I was just sobbing. I was so angry. I was, j- I, it was just on my mind. So I go through phases where I'm feeling really confident about the hard work that I've done and that the team does and that the players that signed are going to benefit from. And then I go through these whole periods of time where I'm just crying. I'm like, what? What am I not seeing? What don't I know? And so, you know, anecdotally, that's my experience. But when it comes to, you know, what happened last season and what we finally got, and I feel like I really should be confident, and then all the wind comes out of my sails, in my mind, it's an opportunity. You know, we were able to say to the league, hey, we aren't moving forward until we have these core priorities handled. I mean, there were whole times where I was on the phone with players explaining the need for workers' comp. I'm like, I need to explain to you what workers' comp means. If you get hurt and you can't go to your day job, you will be covered. Like that, like there were there were times where I was explaining the most the most important parts of our contract, and people just were unaware of how monumental they were. So to be able to finally articulate it, fight for it get it in, in every, in, in verbiage changes and clause changes in whole clauses being removed and dropped, like in these monumental changes and whole players are like, no, we don't even want to read it. I, I can guarantee you that the entire PWHPA has not read our contract. Hmm. So it's frustrating. I'm frustrated. And also at sometimes I cry, but also sometimes I'm really pumped because I'm like, Woo, we did it. Yeah, I I mean that all seems valid. It it does seem valid. And so then I guess to kind of, you know, that, that was a heavy question. I know I, I, I tossed that at you, but I I I felt you you're you're going to get a piece of it. Uh and but I want to now so so you said, you know, there are things that you're taking away and that it sounds like almost dare I say that you're encouraged about uh, given this whole situation that it opens opportunities so so Anya when you think about what you want the next off season to look like you know and and who knows honestly with with now the PWHPA and and the NWHL running um simultaneously um what what do you want to to make sure that that you're able to do for the players that play in the league? Because that's you know you got to control the controllables. What do you want to make sure that you are able to do prior to those players um, you know leaving for the off season to to make sure you have a good working understanding of what w- w- was successful, where you were able to you know to thread a few needles, and then what needs to happen because we know that women's hockey has to grow. Um, so, so, you know, have you thought of, of how you're going to do that? Is there a mechanism that you have in place to do that? So right now, my main goal 
in all of this. Like I said, you've got my two like this season goals, which are my recovery goals and then my financial goals, which is not only the, the deals. That's great. I, I'm definitely passionate about that. But I'm more thinking of like financial advisors and planners or somebody to help investment opportunities, different things like that for players. That's something mm-hmm. that I've got cooking on the back the back burner that right. I think is going to really help them differentiate their portfolios and build a, a nest egg that they can do their next thing with. Um, at any at any rate, I mean, investing five dollars is better than investing zero dollars. So trying to understand that is definitely one of my core priorities. But then when I think about phasing into the off season and what the precursor to season 2020, 2021 looks like for me, it's finding a way to bridge the gap, to bridge the conversation, to even better understand like, hey, we're not moving forward unless we have these 10 want lists and maybe eight of them I can't perform on. But at least getting a holistic need for women's hockey is is crucial to our successes as the NWHLPA. Our goal is to move the sport forward. So not only do I want players to make more money, great, yep, number one goal always. But how do we talk to the PWHPA? How do we, how do we put an olive branch out there? What needs to change with women's hockey that, they're, that people are willing to collaborate? That's what, that's what we need. It doesn't, what does a win look like at the end of this season? I don't know. I can't tell you that I think the sport is winning If the NWHL has a successful fifth season and the PWHB has a successful Dream Gap Tour, that to me sounds broken. So how do we fix it? That's the only way we can move forward. And, you know, I think I'm going to I'm going to throw you another hypothetical and you take this, you know, in in any way you see fit. But, you know, another piece of this is that although you are working within the NWHL, you're not necessarily working for the league itself so are there things that you want the even right now for this this fifth season that you want the league to focus on or or things that that you really want to see the league be able to make progress on in good faith um, of the contract as it exists and to get you closer to some of those things that are on your wish list yeah I think that a lot of it has to do with um, you know something that was raised by the PWHPA is the treatment. And it's something that's so crucial. It's something that, that every single one of us that played in a league that didn't get paid or what we would call glorified beer league, or, you know, we would always like joke around internally, but now it's, it's, it's not a joke anymore. And it's not something that we can sit and stand idly by, you know, it's constantly, anytime I hear something from a player, that's not in my opinion, up to par with what players deserve. I'm like, no, don't accept that. Like push back. And when you do, I expect a result. And that's something that I've been abundantly clear with the league head office. And we've always, or or not always, we've, we've now been extremely collaborative. And I think that a lot of this has put fear in the women's hockey market. And I think that there's a lot of distrust and there's a lot of misinformation and there's a lot of stress, but what the league needs to do, in my opinion, is elevate constantly. Innovate, elevate, meet new partners, be different, be bold, be powerful, but do it for your players and for no one else. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, right on. And so just to, just to clarify, you don't mean treatment as in like recovery treatment, but as in no, no, how I mean like players the, are treated. Treat, yeah, yeah, correct. And I'm always like, like, I always encourage players. I'm like, if you don't like something, say it immediately. Say it to the point of where you feel like, "Mm, probably not my place to say this, but say it. Like, if you need something to change, ask for what you want. We cannot progress forward as a sport if we don't flag things that will not stand. If we don't say, hey, we deserve this. You know, I I want brand new water bottles at every practice. It seems a little crazy to me, but if that's something that you want, say it. Because it can't happen if we don't say it. And at the end of the season, we go, whoa, we have the same water bottles all practice. Whatever it is, say it. You want something to change? Throw it out into the universe. We're going to find a way. I'll put it on my list of things. And, and until we start being comfortable, making each other uncomfortable, we're not going to move forward. Yeah, that's really interesting. Into that, 
to that extent, I would imagine that uh, eventually we will have player representatives from each of the teams. So where's the PA with that? And, um, you know, do you have an expectation of, of when we'll get to know who, who those players are that are representing their respective teams? Yes. So my goal is to have it all, you know, play teams are starting to engage with one another. They're starting to go to practices. They're starting to, you know, meet each other and, and start to gel. By the time season begins, so October 4th is probably when in my mind I've got this like slated to have the, um, you know, captains when I know who they are um, because the captains can't be on the PA. So that's kind of the the dichotomy here. You have the captains Mm -hmm. who are usually in direct contact with the GM every day. And then you have the PA leaders who are in contact with me every day. And, you know, Mm -hmm. it's all meant to be checks and balances and work um, cohesively together. So once we understand better who the um, captains are, they can do the slating for voting on um, the PA, but, you know, right at the beginning of October, I hope that that team is ready to go firing and ready to, um, you know, stand up and be vocal and doesn't necessarily mean to the media. It means to their, their people internally, to me, to, to progressing the sport forward and being really willing to be uncomfortable yeah, that's really interesting. First, that uh, you know, because as you said it, I was like, oh yeah, that I think for at least at least one season, maybe going back to two, we haven't seen captains serve as um, you know PA reps. So that's really interesting. Going back to that checks and balances, and I know I spoke to Danny that going back to even having general managers was another way to kind of. Um, and if I, this is me speaking, uh, you know, just having followed the Riveters so closely, probably because of some of the challenges that they had to have a captain also have to communicate directly to the coach who is also the GM it can be complicated but then add them now potentially you know having negotiations as a player rep uh, as a PA rep that could be a lot so I think that's a really interesting approach to it um, yeah. and it's a lot of time I'm always yeah. conscientious that not only are the players not making enough they're not and I never I will never ever say that I believe that they are the players, as so long as the business is growing, player salary should grow absolutely. Which is why I was so adamant about working together on this, um, and and honestly, why I was so excited when we negotiated the fifty fifty split because the business should grow when the players get paid, and that should be mutually beneficial. Now, I'll never say that the players make enough money, but that's also why we kind of separate out the roles too. Mm-hmm. A captain is going to have too much on their plate to also be a PA head to also communicate with all these people. It's not, it's not right. So really separating it out to not only share in the, the checks and balances, but also share in the, the equity and work. Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, you gave us, uh, I think, a really good overview of some of the current news, refreshing folks on what has happened since, um, you know, we really got uh, the off season started. Uh, but I just want to make sure that if there's anything that you're excited about, because, you know, we talked about some pretty heavy stuff, but are, are there things that you're excited about that are coming through the PA that people can expect? Is there anything that we missed in the conversation that you'd like to set the record straight on? I'm giving you the floor. What's most important to me is that people know that the goals of all of these groups, of any group right now that's that's speaking out on women's sports and women's hockey, is to progress women's fo- is to progress women forward. In women's hockey, we all agree there could be more. There could be more money. There could be more sponsors. There could be more collaboration. There could well, I don't know if we all agree on that, but there could be more and better, right? But how do we get there? And for me, it comes from coming to the table, being able to lay everything bare and say, where do we go from here? And that's what I want women's hockey to become. And that's why every person that came before us and every person that put all the sweat equity in. And and that's why we all need to come together and just be one cohesive group of people to say, egos aside, pride aside, my idea aside, your idea aside. Let's just put it all on the table and talk from every angle. I mean, it's just such a frustrating experience when we all want the same thing, but we're not yet willing to work together to do so on, on any level. And I'm not saying it, one side is more equipped and one side is not. That's absolutely not what I'm saying because there's great things happening on both sides. How do we maximize that and amplify it? That's by working together. And that's where we're not there yet. It's, it's, that's the truth about women's hockey. 
Well, there you have it from Anya Packer herself. Although I don't think you've changed your handle on Twitter, have you? Are, are we still using Badalino? I, you know what? This is like <laughs> number one argument, like WWE Smackdown in this house. If I'm going to change it to Ooh. Packer A. I'm like, oh. no. I'm okay. going to keep the handle. So you like, okay, so I don't know what it's technically called. But like, if you look up your your handle, it will say Anya Packer. But the actual at symbol is still Badalino A. That's me. And then Maddie kind of backed me up a little bit. She was like, that's kind of your brand. I was like, I know. How do I just lose that? Because I've you had can't that lose the brand. On, on Twitter and Instagram, my same handle from the day I started in the league. Because one used to be Anya B. Weird. Like, I hated that one, but whatever. And then I found my little niche, and now I'm going to lose it to be Packer A. <laughs> that sounds like a weird Canadian twist on my wife's name. Packer, Packer eh? <laughs> <laughs> Like, who scored that goal? Packer, eh? Like, that's not going to be me, I don't think. <laughs> not going to be you, but you're no. still going to be knocking around with the PA. I don't know. I, I, are you are you coming on the broadcast? I know at least one of my, my colleagues has been begging for it. So any news on that front? A little birdie said Ooh. I might be able to. That then the problem is I'm gonna have to not wear my Packers jersey while on the podcast because I might get fired <laughs> from being non-biased. Because I'm already that's already like my number one argument. People are like, ah, oh, she's so biased. Like for sure, I love my wife, and that's probably my biggest bias in all of history. I'm good. <laughs> if I'm doing that, I'm not doing too bad. <laughs> I, I was going to say, there are definitely worse things than, you know, standing standing by your wife. So, you know. She's going like, to, like, literally turn the puck over in the neutral zone and be like, ooh, great play by Madison Packer. <laughs> it was so, such a good turnover. I mean, yeah. that's as good as they get. Right, right. Like, best time to make a mistake right there. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Oh, man. Well, we hope to hear you on the broadcast one way or another. Um, always a pleasure to talk to you, whether it's Badalino or now Packer. Anya, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. You do so much for us. And honestly, if I can give you an interview and, and I can contribute to the growth of the sport through your mouthpiece, I'm, I'm doing my job. I really appreciate the time. Oh, shucks. <laughs> Thank you for that. And uh, yeah, we're going to have to definitely have you back on. Perfect.